The first video in the Elements of Self-Defense Laws series briefly discussed how you need to be an innocent party if you want to be able to successfully claim legal self-defense in court. This next video is going to deal with imminence or the impending danger of the circumstances. Here we go. If this is your first time on the channel, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell to stay updated on all the Defensive Firearms Instruction YouTube videos. Stay to the end of this video and get my personal recommendations of a nationally recognized subject matter expert on the laws of self-defense. I happen to be one of the California plank owners of his Laws of Self-Defense instructor program. We're going to talk about the second element of legal self-defense, imminence, or the immediacy of the circumstances. Pay close attention to the variables that I mentioned so you can understand how quickly the immediacy may change and or disappear. I'm Riley Schrader with Defensive Firearms Instructions. I help new and veteran shooters get and improve their defensive shooting skills by teaching the art, science, and laws of self-defense, whether guns are involved or not. I'm not an attorney, I'm not practicing law, and this is not legal advice. To be able to claim legal self-defense, the situation must have an immediate set of circumstances. This is such a basic tenet of self-defense law that a definition about it is in Black's Law Dictionary. Immediate danger, such as must be instantly met, such as cannot be guarded against by calling for the assistance of others or the protection of law, such an appearance of threatened and impending injury as would put a reasonable and prudent person to his instant defense. Yeah, <clears throat> I snuck that in there real quick on you, but I promise I won't be reading case law or penal code sections to you, but this is important. Short version from a 30,000 foot perspective, if the danger is not in your immediate presence, or if it has passed and is no longer a danger, then the law considers that you are not in imminent danger. Your actions may not be preemptive, retaliatory, or punishing. This can get frustrating and confusing very quickly and very easily. Here are some examples. If someone calls you on the telephone and tells you that when they get off work, they're going to drive down to your place and beat you up. You are not legally allowed to go over to their location and use force against them. If you did that, you would be seen as the aggressor because although that person made a credible threat against you, they had not developed it into an imminent danger so that such an appearance of threatened and impending injury as would put a reasonable person and prudent person to his instant offense. Remember that? Prosecutors certainly do. This does not mean that you should ignore those threats. It only means that you may not use preemptive force against someone. The next example is someone sucker punched you quite forcefully and broke your nose, then immediately stopped, backed up, raised their hands in a placating manner and said, I don't want to fight you, and continued to step away from you. Even though your broken nose is easily in the great bodily inju injury category, because that person is no longer presenting an imminent danger to you, you would not be legally justified in using force against them. Now, if that person changed their mind and began to close the distance towards you again, that would constitute a second attack and you would be exceedingly justified in using an appropriate amount of force to defend yourself from that attack. And here's where things can go sideways. 
if, in the course of defending yourself from that second attack, you gain the upper hand and you dish out your version of street justice, the courts will likely be predisposed to view those extra pun punches as punishment. This especially holds true in the higher levels of deadly force. If you've shot an attacker and he's no longer behaving in a manner consistent with attacking you or preparing to attack you again, any additional shots on your part will place you in extreme jeopardy of being accused of using excessive force. Yes, there are variables to each one of these, and to make matters even worse, those variables may escalate and de-escalate many times throughout the incident. Also, the perception of witnesses may not be the same as yours. The witnesses may not have your same level of training and experience and may not recognize for themselves the immediate danger that you are facing. What all this means is that you will have to be able to explain your actions to people who are not even there. Because you're studying the legal elements of self-defense law, you should be able to articulate the actions of the suspect that forced you to use an amount of force necessary to defend yourself. The details of such a statement are best left for you and your experienced attorney to discuss prior to making an official statement. You might consider a very bare bones statement to an investigating officer at the scene so that you're representing yourself as a cooperative victim. In my self-defense law presentation, I discuss the pros and cons of the conventional wisdom of not talking to the police at all versus helping the police to identify suspects, evidence, potential witnesses. Remember, your use of force against another person is called self-defense. It's not called self-retaliation, self-preemptive strike, or self-justice. The next video is going to be on the proportionality of your defensive force. No, you may not nuke them from orbit because it's the only way to make sure. Please, again, don't take my word for any of this. Do your own research. And in the course of that, look up Andrew Branca. He is a nationally recognized expert on self-defense law. His book, The Laws of Self-Defense, third edition, is required reading to add to your complete defensive skill set. If you like this video and you want to learn more about the elements of self-defense law, subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell to stay updated on the rest of the elements of self-defense law series. There's lots more coming. I'm Riley Schrader. Thanks for watching and see you next time with Defensive Firearms Instruction.